Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm joined once again by my great friend Joe Stanley. Welcome, Joe. Darcy, it's always so lovely to be here with you. Life is finally freeing up here in Melbourne. Doesn't it feel good just venturing out, rediscovering the hairdressers? Yes, Thank looking goodness. great, Joe, by the way. And of course, family and friends moving out of your suburb, even. It just feels like school's out for summer. Amazing, just the little bits of freedom, how much we've enjoyed them. It's been yes. a pretty hard road. But the stats say it all. We are getting back to a more familiar way of life. But it's fair to say there are some things that will not change and will be with us for a long while. Probably hygiene is going to become a big issue, Joe, going forward. Yeah, I mean, who would have thought we'd need someone to tell us how to wash our hands properly, Dust? What a strange year. There's been songs, memes, community service announcements and campaigns. So there's no excuses when it comes to clean hands. Well, I must admit, I'm concerned we were all becoming a bit germophobic, uh, Joe. I always thought that, you know, getting out and uh, mixing was probably a healthy thing to do for our immune system. But anyway, go anywhere, Joe, and there is hand sanitizer. It's without a doubt the most used product of the time and has sparked a booming business. We had the Four Pillars gin owner who started making alcohol based hand sanitizer on the show earlier this year. Yeah, alcohol-based sanitizers contain ethanol along with various other chemicals. And most are safe in small quantities. However, used in the wrong way, these products can actually poison. Many of the products are colourful and scented, which make them especially attractive to kids. Here's Sydney paediatrician Dr Karen Zwee with an eye-opening story about her recent interaction with a six-year-old who swallowed hand sanitizer. So what were the totality of her symptoms that you noticed? So she initially just complained of um, double vision and feeling dizzy. And then it progressed quite rapidly. Her family noticed she was drowsy. She had slurred speech. She began vomiting. Um, and slowly her level of consciousness deteriorated. That already presented her to an emergency department at this time. Vomiting increased. She slowly started slipping into unconsciousness and required ventilation in the intensive care unit. How did you work out that it was hand sanitizer that she'd ingested? Oh, well, it did require a little bit of detective work. In fact, her sister told us that she smelt of hand sanitizer. So that obviously set alarm bells ringing. Um, we did a series of blood tests, including the alcohol level, and that came back extremely high. Her blood alcohol reading was 0.19%. So if you think of the legal limit for driving, it's 0.05%. So she was about four times higher than the legal driving limit for an adult. Um, that's a pretty toxic dose and could absolutely be lethal. And in this instance, how did you treat her? So she required supportive management. She required um, hydration, ventilation, because she couldn't maintain her airway, treatment of her electrolyte abnormalities. She had, for example, a low potassium and acidosis in the blood and a very low blood sugar, which is um, the key thing that health professionals really need to look out for in this type of poisoning. Um, she didn't require ventilation for very long and I think within 24 hours or so she was up and about and back to her normal self. So that's how resilient children can be, um, but it could have gone a lot worse. And she's pretty lucky to have made it out um, unscathed. Since the beginning of the pandemic, beginning of February, we have had uh, over a 1,000 calls to the New South Wales Poison Centre regarding hand sanitizer exposure. That's two and a half times the number of calls we had in the same period last year. So quite a significant increase. And of the calls that we've had this year, three quarters of them are in children under the age of five. A lot of them are very appealing. They can be in nice bottles. They can smell beautiful. Sometimes they're a lovely colour. Is that a problem? Yeah, look, we are concerned about, particularly about bottles uh, that appear to have pop tops or are in bright colours and are appealing to children and can be mistaken for drink bottles. Uh, hand sanitizer is a poison and, yes, it should be stored safely and it's not something 
to uh, be taken lightly. It should be treated as other poisons are and uh, children should be made aware that this is not something that they drink or that they taste and it needs to be stored away safely and only pulled out when used. What about childproof packaging? Does there need to be more work done there? So it is an option and it is something that, that will be considered, but it is certainly by no means a silver bullet. And childproof packaging is not childproof. Mm. There is child-resistant packaging and we see cases where kids get into child-resistant packaging all the time um, and we need to still make sure that the products are easily usable by other people who need them within the community. What would be your top tips for parents when purchasing hand sanitizer? I would be saying to choose a product that uh, doesn't have a free-flowing lid, um, so ideally, and, and not a pop-top, not a, any sort of packaging that could be mistaken for a drink bottle. Ideally, a gel product. Gel products um, are less likely to consume large amounts in a short space of time than a, than a free-flowing liquid. Uh, and ideally, something that is made in Australia because uh, we know that the regulations around the types of alcohols of the products made in Australia is quite tight. I don't think that there's a big need to have large amounts of hand sanitizer in the house. Um, I think it, it can be small amounts that can be reserved for use when people are out. If we are concerned that our child has actually ingested hand sanitizer, what should we do? Uh, I would say call the Poison Centre. Call us on 13 11 26. Uh, we're there 24 hours a day and we'll be able to perform a risk assessment, an individual risk assessment for your particular case and determine what's happened and what the risk is for that case and whether or not any further action needs to be taken. Well, there's another product to keep on the out-of-reach shelf with the booze and the other chemicals, Das. Yeah, it is a fair point, Joe, made by Dr Genevieve Adamo there about packaging. If kids want to get into something, they generally will. Mm -hmm. So it's tricky finding the balance between packaging that's easy access for adults but that kids can't open. Yeah, absolutely. I'm lucky that my daughter has never had any issues, Das, but we keep our all of our chemicals on such a high shelf in our laundry. If anything, I'm going to just break my neck falling <laughs> off the ladder <laughs> as I climb up there. So. Well, coming up, it's the agricultural spin on the Archibald Prize, the art competition inspiring the farmers of the future. That's coming up next on the House of Wellness. Well, 2020 has made us rethink pretty much everything about the way we live, from what we consume, our relationships with each other, and the environment and the impact we have on the planet, Joe. And this year, Das, has pushed me to reconnect to two of my greatest loves, art and nature. So I was already really passionate about reducing waste and greenhouse gas emissions, and I just love art for the way it can change your mood straight away. Yeah, great stuff, Joan. One thing I always look forward to is the Archibald Prize. And this year, it was a portrait of AFL champion Adam Goods that won. It was painted by Vincent Namajira, and I think it'll be in the Art Gallery of New South Wales until January next year if you want to check it out. And I had the great privilege this year, Joe, yes. of being painted for the Archibald. Really? It was a friend of my dad's who uh, they used to play a lot of golf together. And I think Roy might be closer to the 80 than 70. So mm -hmm. pretty brave thing for a first time entering into the Archibald at that age. Yeah. Clearly didn't win, but uh, it did very well. It was a great experience. What an amazing thing to see how an artist captures you on the canvas. Are you well, a bit nervous? Well, I found nervous? it, uh, <laughs> even just watching it at the time, I just, how do you start with a blank bit of paper yeah. and then capture someone's image? It was fascinating. And uh, as I said, for someone who was an amateur to enter the Archibald, great effort. And I can't wait to get to Sydney to see the winner of the Archibald Prize. But there's also a new contender in the art competition stakes. It's called the Archie Bull Prize, which is all about inspiring kids to think about farming, not only as a career, but as a way to express themselves creatively and learn at the same time. For nearly 200 years, Lynn Strong's family have been dairy farming in the tiny town of Jamboree, New South Wales. I'm a sixth generation farmer, very, very enthusiastic about farming and milking cows. But in the early 2000s, Australia's milk price war threatened to destroy the family business. 
unless Lynn could find a way to farm a lot more milk and fast. So what we did was we decided that we would grow our business by milking our cows three times a day. On most farms, cows only need to be milked twice a day. To be milked more often, they need to be fed extra nutritious grass. So Lynn turned to the latest environmental research. We were able to bring in revegetation teams, bush regeneration teams, and ensure that we grow the best quality grass that we possibly could, the most energy efficient grass, the most drought resistant grass. So we were able to graze two and a half times the industry average of cows per hectare. And also by milking them three times a day, we were able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions per litre of milk produced by 30%. And that's something that we can really be proud of, reducing our footprint on the planet. Sustainable farming saved Lynn's family business, but it also opened her eyes to the challenges facing future generations. We're farming in really complex and challenging times, and particularly adapting and mitigating to climate change. So if we're gonna have profitable, climate resilient farming systems, we need to attract the best and the brightest. The statistics say that young people going from primary school to high school have closed their minds to 70% of careers, let alone careers in agriculture. So it is absolutely pivotal that agriculture find a really creative way to be front of mind when they're thinking about careers. In 2010, Lynn created a one-of-a-kind high school competition, inviting students to present their own solutions to big agricultural issues, not through an exam or an essay, but by painting their ideas onto a life-sized fiberglass cow. So we've been learning about like what soils you can use and what soils you can't and what different like minerals and all that sort of stuff are in soil. And we've been learning about like bugs and what they can do for the environment. The plan we've got for the cow is to have a tree coming out of the top and to bring importance of soil into it. So we're thinking we have like bacteria and different types of bugs that live in the soil and what they can do for the soil. It's pretty exciting, to be honest. I'm not a very big farm kid. Like, I didn't grow up on a farm, but this has definitely made it a lot more fun. 85% of careers in agriculture are beyond the farm gate. 40% of careers in agriculture are in cities. There's a career for everybody in agriculture. And we're able to, through this program, open young people's minds to that and just how exciting they are, how diverse they are, how highly innovative and technical agriculture is today. The top 10 Archibald Prize statues go on display each year at the Sydney Royal Easter Show. And the competition has proven so popular that Lynn has even launched a spin-off program for primary schools called Creative Koalas. For the forehead, we're planning to put an earth with a lot of like trees and bushes around the outside of it. So that's saying that like our plant, our planet grows a lot of plants and that we got it, like those plants are vital. Young people might be only be 20% of the population, but they're 100% of the future. It is absolutely pivotal that they get an opportunity to be at the decision-making table and be able to design the bright future that we all want to see for them. You know, Joe, we have some of the best ag science and agronomy courses in the world right here. And by 2030, it's estimated there'll be around 48,000 new jobs in the rural sector, which is fantastic. Great field to steer our kids towards. And it's girls who are leading the charge. They make up more than 56% of students studying agriculture and related courses. But back to the Archibald Prize, entries for 2021 are now open, so head to their website to check out how you and your kids can be part of it. Coming up, the 10 most nutritious ingredients in the world but first, solving the puzzle of how to talk to teens. Now, I'm interested in this one. I've got <laughs> some issues myself. It's coming up next on The House of Wellness. <laughs> Welcome back to The House of Wellness. Jo, it's always a balancing act with the four kids trying to find the right balance between maybe some boundaries, not being too soft and laying down the law. I always think of uh, the famous quote from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, mm -hmm. that the richest inheritance any child can have is a stable, loving, disciplined family life. 
good friend of mine who's a father of five pass that on to me and I talk to Beck about that a lot, trying to get that balance between boundaries and plenty of love. Yeah, it is really hard and there's no doubt parenting is one of the most challenging jobs you can have. My daughter's 11, so we haven't quite got to the stage of slamming doors and telling me that she hates me. I'm, I'm expecting it. But I must say what I do and I really focus on is trying to listen to her and sometimes the messages are non-verbal. <laughs> you really have to pick that up and sort of be curious and calm about it and not try and respond. Well, you know, trying not to respond with my own agenda, that can be very hard. And I must say, if parenting was a test, the last six months really has been quite hard for many, many people. And I don't think I have ever used the word no quite as much and nor has my daughter. <laughs> mm. Well, it's part of the job description for teenagers to want to rebel and work out who they are, which is fair enough being forced to stay home and not see their mates or do the things that they love and they're used to has definitely been a really tricky thing to negotiate in this challenging year, Jo. Absolutely, and I really feel for them. The lockdown has been a huge learning curve for all of us worldwide. US-based parenting expert Dr Christine Carter has got her hands full with four kids of her own, just like you, Darce. So it was interesting to get her thoughts on wrangling the kids when the hormones kick in. Obviously, nobody enjoys being locked down in a pandemic, but why is it particularly hard for teenagers? Well, it, it is really, really hard for teenagers. And one thing that's really universal for adolescents is their drive for autonomy and freedom. They just weren't hardwired to be locked down at home, social distancing, to not be able to school, go to school every day and kind of get out from under their parents' thumb. So they're really suffering from a loss of control just when they're developmentally really pushing for it. So this makes them super touchy about whether or not they're being treated like little kids. And teenagers just really tend to feel infantilized when parents are more controlling about their whereabouts. Um, and of course, you know, adolescents experience their emotions much more intensely than adults. Uh, this is normal and appropriate, but it can be really distressing to us as parents. Is there a particular way we should be speaking with or to our children, though, to try and alleviate the tension between us and them? Yeah, well, uh, it works much better when we are, when we use non-controlling language, right? When we don't just tell them what to do. So my absolute favourite way to talk to teenagers is just to ask them questions about what their plans are. So my kids have joked that they're going to get me a t-shirt that says, what's your plan? Because instead of saying, hey, I really think you should get some exercise today, <laughs> I'll say, hey, what's your plan for getting some exercise today? So they all know, but it's it feels really different than me just issuing a directive. Also, I noticed that the word should isn't a great word. Yes, and you know, it can just sound like a little tiny semantic thing, but whenever we can remove the word should from our vocabulary, what we're doing is removing that element of force that kids tend to react so poorly to. So saying, hey, it, it, it might be better if is even better than saying like you should, or anytime you can say, do you want to? Um, do you need to? Like any, anything like that, asking a question is so much better than saying, honey, you really should get some exercise. How important is it to set boundaries and actually give tasks to our adolescents, our teenagers? It is so important to, to give tasks to teenagers. A lot of times, you know, parents will say to me, oh, but they're so busy and they're so burdened by all these things. And, um, and, and then what they're doing, what we do when we don't give our kids chores is we basically teach them that they're entitled to our service. And that doesn't feel good to anyone. The research very, very clearly shows that kids really do much better when we um, give them specific roles in the family, right? When we give them specific tasks, I'll make a list and kid, my kids can sort of opt in to the ones that are most appealing to them. So like anything related to the dog goes first. But I also will put things on the list like um, keeping conflict in our household low, right? Like 
which is a really important role to play and sort of gets them thinking of, oh, that's a contribution to the household or who wants to plan something fun for us to all to do together. And um, that helps me, it gets, it gets a, like, I like to do things with my teenagers. And since we're all in the same bubble, they, they're feeling a little bit more like, I guess. Yeah, well, I guess we'll all do something together, right? We'd like to get out of the house too. I feel like sometimes as adults we're a little unfair on our teenagers because we expect them to be little mini adults and they're not, are they? No, they're they're not mini adults but they are half adults. That's the way I think of adolescence. They're half little kid and half adult. And so when we talk to them, if we ask them questions and aren't really forceful, if we talk to the adult in them, a lot of times the adult will show up because that's the high status part of themselves in terms of the way they see themselves. And teenagers, as we all know, are very attuned to social status. So we can make it work for us. Well, I'm definitely taking notes there, Joe. Mm -hmm. What's your plan is the way we've got to frame our question. Mm -hmm. Simple, but you can see how a question like that makes it seem like we're not dictating or nagging them. And as we said, it's that fine balance, is it, between being there and interested, but not overlaying our world onto theirs. Yeah, absolutely. I really love that question, what's your plan, because you're giving them the responsibility and making them feel like they have power over their own decisions. I must say I've tried it. How did it go What's your plan? Nothing has been her response. <laughs> so that then falls back to me to go, OK, give me just one plan for the day, just one plan for exercise or just anything. <laughs> I don't know. I'm no expert. But I also like her description of a teenager being half kids and half adults. So if you talk to the adult part of them, you'll generally get a more mature response. But the teenage years are not easy. I must say I remember how hard it was for me. So I have a huge amount of compassion for our kids. Oh, there's a huge amount going on in those mm. years, isn't there? As a teenager, the hormones, you're trying to find out where you fit in, who you are, how you interact with people. And as we talk about a lot, Joe, you're doing that now through the lens of social media and you're constantly being reminded of whether you're included or whether you're not. It's a pretty tricky era for teenagers. Yeah, it's super hard. Not to mention the pimples. But some great <laughs> new research out of the UK brings hope on that front, scientists have found a link between a particular gene and acne. This gene is very effective at fighting blackheads. If you don't have the gene, you get pimples. So it opens up lots of possibilities for new treatments for the 650 million people who suffer from it. Now, that is something that would make a big difference to many teenagers' lives, Joe. And here's something else for you. We talk about the special days and months where we highlight particular causes. Well, this is one to kick off November. The average person spends about 10 to 15 minutes a day on the toilet. <laughs> That's almost eight hours a month. That's an incredible amount, isn't it? it to really raise is. funds for the one in three people worldwide who don't have access to a decent toilet. Water Aid is inviting us all to dedicate our toilet time to learning a new skill. I love this idea. So you could meditate or work on memorising something if you've got a weak memory or learn a language. There's so much you can do on the loo. So many possibilities, <laughs> Jane. Thought of uh, that. Just get your friends to sponsor you for the month and it will help Water Aid reach some of the poorest people on earth who do not have access to a decent toilet. It's learning on the loo, Das. I love it. So around this time of year, a lot of us start thinking about trick or treating. But I'll be trick and treating this year with Andalou's Pumpkin Honey Glycolic Mask. The trick, the absolute magic of a mask working on your skin, and this one has a delicious tingle. And the treat, lighter, brighter, luminous skin, and the pure joy of a bit of self-care. You can use your hands or a brush. I prefer to use a brush because I feel like it's a lot less messy. So I'm just going to start up here. The mask is uniquely formulated using glycolic acid, fruit stem cell science and vitamin C because this is part of the brightening range. And it's blended beautifully with manuka honey and pumpkin. And the combination of ingredients smells like chai. It's beautiful. So perfect for Halloween. <laughs> right about now is when you start to feel that signature tingle. You can really feel the glycolic AHAs working away at those dead skin cells, brushing them away to reveal that luminous skin tone and smooth complexion underneath. 
I love it when you can feel a mask really working. So we've rinsed it off and then you apply your moisturiser, your serum and of course your SPF as the sun comes out and it almost still feels tingly. It just feels so much tighter. All the dead skin cells are gone. The skin tone is looking much smoother and look how luminous that is as the sun hits the skin. Oh my gosh, what a trick and a treat. Well, let's imagine the ideal food, Joe, a food that contains all the daily nutrients we need. Well, such a food doesn't exist, as we know, but how about the next best thing? Scientists in the UK studied more than 1,000 foods, giving each a nutritional score. The higher the score, the more likely each food would meet your daily needs when eaten in combination with others on the list. Now, we can't run through the whole 1,000 items, but here's Heinze with the top 10. So I'm here at the Cambridge Markets in Sydney and today my mission is to track down what are considered to be the top 10 most nutritious foods in the world. But I'm going to make it a bit tougher. Not only am I going to find all of these foods, but I'm going to combine them all into one recipe and come up with what technically should be the world's most nutritious dish. First up, Swiss chard. Just a small serving of this leafy green gives you your daily dose of vitamin K to help with blood clotting and bone health and supports your immune system with a ton of antioxidants. Next up, another leafy green. Is it spinach? Is it kale? Nope, it is beet greens. The next time you are cooking with beetroot, don't you dare throw these away. They're extremely high in vitamins A and C, essential for healthy vision and skin. Plus, they have a delicious, sweet taste. Now, it's not all greens on this list. That would make for a pretty bland meal. Some of the most nutritious foods on the planet are deceptively tiny. Pumpkin seeds and chia seeds are an amazing source of minerals like iron and magnesium. Plus, they're packed full of fibre, which help keep you feeling really full without you having to load up on calories. The other tiny ingredient on this list is one of my favourite healthy snacks, almonds. Now, you may have already gathered from the whole almond milk latte revolution that these nuts are a fantastic source of calcium, but they also help lower your blood pressure and cholesterol. I'm going to be grabbing a tonne of these. Thank you. Unfortunately, there's a food on the list that you'll be hard-pressed to find in Australia. It's a fruit called the cherry moya, or custard apple. It's packed with B vitamins, which help boost your energy and brain function. But luckily, there's another item on the list which meets those needs, and I bet it's not what you're expecting. It's pork fat. Yep, a type of fat made the list. I mean, this should prove once and for all that not all fats are bad. Unsaturated fats are an important part of a healthy diet. Just uh, don't drink this all at once. Now I know what you're thinking. What sort of bizarre meal am I going to cook with pork fat and a bunch of veggies, seeds and nuts? To be honest, I'm kind of thinking the same thing. This could be my saviour. Seafood is incredible. It's low in calories and saturated fat and high in just about everything else. So that explains why three of the top ten most nutritious foods in the world can be found right here at Josh Nyland's Fish Butchery. Perch, flatfish and snapper. And it saves me, really, because I'm thinking now I'm going to do a bit of oven-baked fish, a nut and seed crumb and, you know, a bit of a modern take on things. So here's what I've come up with. Oven-baked snapper on a bed of sautéed greens with chilli and garlic. We're going to cook everything in pork fat today, and as they say, fat is where the flavour is at. So these greens are not going to be bland or boring, let me tell you. To make use of the seeds and almonds, I'm combining them with some of the herbs, mustard, chilli flakes, lemon, and of course my new best friend, pork fat, to create a zesty, spicy crust to go on top of the fish. And there you have it, the world's most nutritious dish. It might look incredibly colourful and I tell you what, it is packed with so many vitamins and minerals, but you're not going to want to eat it if it doesn't taste any good. So let me dig in. That crust. Mmm. Okay. Herby, nutty, seedy. The fish is perfect. We've got that zesty kind of flavour, that lemon from the crust on the fish combined with that chilli and garlic from the greens. 
It is a 10 out of 10 from me, and, and I'm not biased at all. You've got to try it. <laughs> I tell you, I love a guide. Wouldn't it be great to just take that list to the supermarket with you? The top 50 was dominated by fish and seafood, herbs and greens. Almonds came in at number one with a nutritional score of 97. But how good was Heinzy pulling all those ingredients together in one dish? He's so clever. Oh, he does a great job, uh, Heinzy. We miss him. A few mm. weeks back, we ran a story on the thyroid gland, a butterfly-shaped gland at the front of the neck. The thyroid might be small, but it's responsible for so much from regulating our energy levels to our weight, skin, hair, and even our moods. And while taking care of your thyroid isn't something you might think about, there are some simple ways to make sure yours is in tip-top shape. I've got to say, Nat, this is the strangest combination of picnic ingredients I have ever seen. What is going on here? Well, you obviously haven't been to a thyroid optimising picnic before, Luke. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we have here is my favourite thyroid healing foods. And the reason they're my favourite is they contain really important nutrients that allow your thyroid to function properly. So salmon, which is rich in iodine. We have uh, the steak there, which is a really good source of protein, iron and zinc. Carrots, rich in vitamin A. Brazil nuts, rich in selenium. And we also have some broccoli and sauerkraut, which are really good for optimising optimising gut health, which is connected to your thyroid health. OK, so we're going to have some really healthy thyroids going on right now, but can we just take a step back? What is the thyroid? Great question. So your thyroid is a gland that sits in your neck and it's responsible for the energy production of every single cell in your body. So it has an influence over your gut health, your mood, your memory, your cognition and your weight as a few examples. OK, so what affects our thyroid health? Well, I would say what doesn't affect our thyroid health is a better question because everything, and I like to narrow it down to three umbrella areas. So that is nutrition, which was spoken about to a degree, sleep, and also stress. So stress being environmental stress, chemical stress, physical stress, or mental and emotional stress as well. We often hear about people having an overactive thyroid and an underactive thyroid. What does that mean? So it means that they either have not enough thyroid hormones or too much thyroid hormones going through their body. The most common signs of an underactive thyroid are things like fatigue, brain fog, memory loss, inability to lose weight despite trying your best or perhaps not changing anything. Could also be that you have cold hands or feet or you might be experiencing hair loss or um, poor, poor skin health as well is another common example. What about the signs of an overactive thyroid? So it's kind of opposite. So everything in your body is being turned up. So you might have a rapid heart rate, excessive sweating, and you might be losing weight unintentionally as well. So obviously eating delicious, nutrient-dense foods like this is a great way to balance our thyroid. Is there anything else we can do? OK, Nat, so I gather from our costume change here that keeping active is good for our thyroid? Absolutely, it is. So movement is really beneficial for our thyroid for multiple reasons. Yep. One is that generally exercise is helpful for balancing our hormones and also it's beneficial for managing our stress. The other benefit of doing it outdoors is that we also get exposed to sensible levels of vitamin D. I'm so glad you mentioned stress management, Nat. When I keep my stress levels low, it not only benefits me mentally, but physically as well. Ways that I can do this is through exercise, hanging at the beach with my puppies, device free time and getting a good night's sleep. Sleep is so important for thyroid health. It's when all of your hormones reset, so to speak. And it's not just about getting enough hours of sleep, it's also the quality of sleep. So while we're on the topic of things we do in our home, is there anything we can do to that environment to help our thyroid? Absolutely. I think making sure your home is mold free, decreasing your toxic load by switching out, um, you know, toxic cleaning products for more natural alternatives. Such great tips, Nat. I'm all about getting my thyroid in tip top condition. What else have you got for me? Well, I reckon we go for a run. All right, let's go. Before the break, Heinz revealed the top 10 most nutritious foods and he cooked them into a delicious super dish, which was a pretty good effort from Heinz. Yeah. Seafoods, herbs and greens dominated the top 50 with scallops ranked number 21 and clams coming in at number 28. Mussels are packed with protein, vitamins and minerals like zinc and iron. New Zealand is famous for its green-lipped variety and while we can't travel there quite yet, Heinz and GQ are here to give us a taste of the land of the long white cloud. 
Put your best Kiwi accent on GQ because today we're heading to New Zealand, bro. I mean, through the recipe anyway. I've been to New Zealand, Heinz. It's a beautiful country. And I'm excited to join you on this culinary adventure. Kia ora and tell me more. GQ, what I love about New Zealand produce is that they celebrate all things fresh and local, and this recipe is no different. I'm actually using green-lipped mussels, which is a shellfish that got its name because of the green edge around its shell, and they can only be found in the pristine waters of New Zealand. Did you know, Heinzi, that the native New Zealand Maori people actually discovered the health benefits of green-lipped mussel? Not only tasty, but good for you too. That's a special kind of shellfish. Well, Heinzi, New Zealand green-lipped mussel contains omega-3 fatty acids and glycose amino glycans. Now, that combination helps reduce the symptoms of mild arthritis and joint pain and inflammation. No wonder Kiwis are so good at rugby, huh? Absolutely, Heinzi. And remember, keeping moving is so good for our mental and physical health. But this mighty muscle also contributes towards connective tissue health and it actually gives us healthy joint cartilage growth, all in all contributing to a healthy musculoskeletal system. GQ and some shellfish, like mussels, also contain antioxidant values, which help fight against free radical damage, in particular, which can lead to serious health concerns and ageing. So, mate, when are we heading across the ditch to get some of these firsthand? Well, I hope it's pretty soon, Heinzi, but in the meantime, New Zealand green lit mussel is available in supplement form. Well, massive thanks to our Kiwi friends. Perhaps after this, we could cook up a pavlova, you know, another famous New Zealand recipe. Now, hang on, Heinzi, that's an Aussie dish. <laughs> oh, bro! The A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy. For superior supplement, for healthy energy and vitality, try New Zealand's number one premium supplement. Now available in Australia. Now, Joe, I know you'll be very happy to understand that today is World Vegan Day. And as someone who had a period as a vegan... <laughs> uh, I never said I was going to be vegan. You committed at the start of this year. Can we roll was... the tape back? Because yeah. I said I was going to try a largely plant-based diet. I would never no, I give up, up cheese. Up you have to understand regularly. how much I love cheese. So never vegan. You were going to go largely <laughs> plant-based. And how did that go for you, Joe? It didn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> I did try, though, and I really support a vegan diet if you're able to do it. I do know if you are considering giving vegan a go, then November is the time to try. The whole month is dedicated to educating you about vegan eating and lifestyles. If you're keen, you can take the vegan pledge to go vegan for 30 days by downloading the V-Guide app, and I congratulate you if you do. <laughs> I don't Fair think enough. I'm going to give it a try, though, <laughs> Dars. All right, thank you, Joe. <laughs> Up next, how to take the sting out of sunburn the natural way, right here on The House of Wellness. <laughs> Welcome back. We've had some great days recently, Joe. With summer just around the corner, that means spending more time outside. I love the summer, my favourite yes. time of year. What are you looking forward to this summer? Well, hopefully we can get down to the beach yeah. and uh, spend some time down the Mornington Peninsula. It's a bit of a family uh, holiday that we've done for years and years. So hopefully by that stage we're able to get down. I love getting in the water and the salt water just makes you feel great. Yeah, beautiful. I'm looking forward to picnics. That's going to be my thing for summer, laying out the rug, having all my friends around. It's a nice, safe way of mixing and making sure the Labrador doesn't eat everyone's sandwiches. <laughs> Super fun. But summer also means it's time to break out the hat, sunnies and sunscreen to avoid the sting of sunburn. Well, I think over time we've all become very well educated about taking care in the sun, Joe, but it sometimes can happen that the UV takes its toll and we end up a bit burnt. Oh, absolutely. It always happens for me once every summer. <laughs> I just forget somehow and I end up way red. It's not a good look. Peeling, terrible accessory for summer and it hurts. You just want to sit in an ice bath and you feel so stupid for doing it. But here's the next best thing to help you with that burn. Grease Carter's got one of the most cooling and natural ways to relieve the heat and take the sting out of sunburn. You probably know aloe vera as the bottle you run to the pharmacy for when you've got a little bit sunburnt. But if you've got the plant growing at home, it is so easy to extract the gel and make your own remedies for skin. It's so hydrating and so, so good for your skin and really easy to do. Start off by picking out three or four of the larger leaves on the plant. And you wanna go in 
and cut them right at the base at an angle. You'll need to find a jar, take your leaves and place them cut side facing down in there for about 15 to 20 minutes. And that's because in the aloe vera plant, there is a yellowy greeny sap that's actually a naturally occurring latex and can be a mild irritant for some people's skin. So if we leave it there for 15, 20 minutes, let it drain out before we extract our gel, we get rid of it completely. Once we've wiped them clean, we need a sharp knife and place the curved side down on a chopping board. Press down with your hand and then very carefully slice off the top part of the skin. After that, it's as easy as grabbing a spoon and scooping the gel out. Being careful uh, that if you get any little bits of green skin, just chop those out. Blend it until it's smooth, and if your blender has a pulse setting, use that, because we just wanna make sure that it gets nice and smooth without getting too foamy. So just make sure that it's nice and smooth. And then it's as easy as pouring the mix into an ice cube tray and freezing overnight. But these will also keep for two or three months in the freezer. So you've got a ready to go remedy for sunburn whenever you need it. Now you've got them sitting in the freezer for whenever you need them. And it's as easy as popping one out and applying it to your sunburn or any kind of mild skin irritation. This is gonna be a fantastic remedy for. Remember we used to be told to put butter on burns or vinegar or even milk back in the day? Oh, it's just such a funny old school thing to do. <laughs> like cracking your knuckles will give you arthritis? That's not true. Well, the one that always stays with me is the five second rule, Joe, and I'm a subscriber to it. Anything I... under five seconds. I know we've been told <laughs> that you get a lot of germs and it doesn't work, but for me, that always resonates. Pick it up under five seconds. Yeah. I, I, I happily eat food off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's all we've got time for today. Log on to the House of Wellness website for more great information. And tune in to Joe and Emma Murray's podcast. If you haven't caught it, there's some sensational uh, areas to go to on mindfulness. Joe, where yeah, would you recommend? Absolutely. Well, I think 2020 is a year where we're really trying to engage with our own health and our mental health. And best of you in the House of Wellness might help you. You can download it at podcastoneaustralia.com.au. And tune in to the radio show with Joe and GQ every Sunday. And thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time. Getting more out of life, love, sharing time.